What questions are there this week? What can you do to prevent your animals from dying from West Nile disease? How do we socialize our homeschooled, farm-raised children? And shouldn't we breed our go lacy to just the closest Nubian buck around so that we can get into milk quickly and uh, not have any worries? Why are we not going to breed lacy to just the closest Nubian buck around? We're gonna talk about that answer those questions and many, many more in today's episode of Ask Home Study. This is Ask Home Study, the weekly video that we make where we answer the questions you have left here at our channel. We have a lot of good questions today. If you would like to get a question answered, it can be related to the videos that we've done over the last week. It can be off topic, that's okay. But the only way you can get that question answered on this channel is by asking the question in the comments below any of our videos and then leaving the hashtag AskHomeSteady, all one word. I say it every week, but every week somebody gets it wrong. All one word, AskHomeSteady, connected to the hashtag all together. And that way when I search for questions, when I make this video, which today is now Thursday because I release in the mornings this week, we're experimenting with morning release. Anyway, hashtag Ask Home Study and then I can find your question. We get asked a lot of questions every week and I want to be able to answer your questions so I just need to be able to find them. So, without further ado, let's dive into this week's questions. We have some really good ones. In uh, yesterday's video, we talked about leaving Luna, our calf, on Ladybug for the 11 months that we have had her here on the farm. And we talked about it being a bit of an experiment because all the studies we have found as far as the information goes leaving calves on cows has been very geared towards the dairy industry. That's who funds the studies. There's not a lot of money to fund studies about family cows because the people keeping family cows are like us, just small families with one or two cows. And we are experimenting with leaving Luna on. We are going to be weaning her this month However, we kept her on 11 months. So what is that going to do to her? Are there going to be negative effects? A lot of you have shared stories with us in the comments below, uh, pro and con, leaving the calf on. And uh, we've done our research into family cow keeping. We're going to find out. We're going to see over the next year. So we'll all learn together. Dean, super fan Dean, <clears throat> who gets a question almost every week, says, I wonder if comparing against wild grazers and ruminants would be a good estimate of how long to leave the calf on. Example, buffalo, wild horses, zebras, and deer. Thanks for the video, Austin K. And uh, so Dean, I wanted to talk about this because as we talk about a lot on this channel, agriculture and nature are very different things. And even in agriculture, there are a lot of different things going on as far as what you're trying to do, your goals. And a lot of animal husbandry relates directly to the goals that you have for your herd, for your property. So let's look at the example of grass feeding your livestock. Lots of homesteaders have the goal of grass feeding livestock. You can look to nature and see how it's done in nature and say, look, everything in nature is grass fed, so I should only grass feed my animals. But remember, nature is different from agriculture. Uh, wild ruminants get to roam hundreds of miles across open prairies. Uh, they are not confined like animals on a homestead. So although what is in the wild looks good, we can't exactly mimic what is done in the wild with our animals here on our homestead. Then we come to the question of goals. One farmer might want to completely grass feed their animals, not do any grain because they have something against grain. Maybe they believe it's bad for them or bad for their animals. Uh, whereas another might be more focused on production and say, I'm going to use grain because I want to have the most milk out of my cows. So Dean, instead of looking to the wild animals like zebra, wild horses, buffalo, uh, we try to develop our animal husbandry practices in this manner. This is the way we do it. We establish our goals. What do we want from this livestock? And then we look to people who are achieving the goals that we want and see what practices they do. 
So when we look at our cows and, and Luna and having left Luna on for so long, a lot of people were saying at a month or, or two months that she should be weaned. You'll see people who come from a background in milk cows running a dairy, they wean their calves at a very early age. And that's because the goal of a dairy farm is to have a good production. They want lots of milk to sell. That's how they make their living. So it makes total sense. Wean your calves as soon as it's possible without harming the calf health-wise. Because in the long run, that calf will be your milker the next year and so on and so forth. So a traditional dairy farmer or somebody who grew up on a dairy farm watches us with Luna and by month three or four is saying, why haven't you weaned that calf? You should have weaned that calf a long time ago. But remember, we have different goals than that person. That person is thinking like a dairy man. We are not a dairy farmer. We are a family cow keeper whose goal is not maximum production. Our goal is to have a calf that we don't have to pay to feed. Our goal is to have a healthy calf, as healthy as we can, who grows up to be a good family cow. High production is not our main concern because we believe if you're keeping a family cow, you don't want a high producing cow, especially if you want to, like us, enjoy your agricultural homestead, but also enjoy a life where you can do a little bit of traveling, take a break from milking on a, a weekend day. Keeping a family cow, calf sharing, it works really well with having a life. We have enjoyed calf sharing over the last year. A dairy farmer would cringe at the idea of calf sharing because they would be losing lots of their profit, but we're not losing anything. We're only gaining, well, we are losing something. We are losing milk to Luna, but what we are gaining is the ability to have some flexibility and uh, have a life where we can go on a vacation for uh, an extended period of time, come home and get a gallon plus of milk from our cow. She doesn't have mastitis, she doesn't have any issues. And the question as to whether we are doing long-term harm to Luna, there are pros and cons to both practices. This is a bit of an experiment. However, the breeders we bought Ladybug from have kept their calves on traditionally for eight months. We're in month 11, so we're a little bit past that, but they keep them on for maximum nutrition of their family cow. That's one of their goals, eight months. We look to them as our example. We don't look to a dairy farmer and say, hey, Mr. Dairy Farmer, what are you doing? Because we have different goals. It's okay, all you out there who are dairy farmers, you have more experience in this than us, and you do things your way, we're not saying you're wrong by any means. You're doing things absolutely right for your way. And we're admitting that we're doing a bit of an experiment. We'll find out in a year and change when Luna is old enough to be bred and then having calved. At that point, we'll see what kind of production we get out of her. But we are looking to the example of our breeder and other people in the family cow world that Kay does research and talks to. Uh, we're looking to their examples and following their examples. And we're not ignoring advice from any dairymen out there who've commented below. We're just taking the advice of the people who are doing things similar animal husbandry techniques as to what our goals are. And so that's why you'll see us. Uh, we will be weaning Luna now this month. We have no reason not to at this point. And uh, we do realize it's getting to the point where we should be weaning her. Uh, and we'll see the long-term effects as time goes on. As far as looking to wild animals, Dean, Wild animals, agriculture, and nature are different. So I don't look to any wild animals for examples of what we should do. Wild animals' primary reproduction goals are keep surviving. And so you'll see wild animals will be on the hoof and up and out. Uh, if you look at the example of deer, I have video of deer that were born in the springtime that are just about now weaning. I've watched fawns on our game cameras nursing up to about two or three weeks ago, but now they're starting to wean coming into the fall. Uh, so that would be a three month time period for a deer, but no, we're not mimicking the wild animals that we see. We're just looking at other homesteaders and family cow keepers who are similar goals to us. Catherine Durst asks, is there anything you can do to help prevent West Nile disease, which is what we talked about in a recent video about losing our breeder buck that we were going to be using to West Nile disease. She said it would be sad if the same thing happened to Lacey and Gizmo. So Catherine, is there anything you can do to avoid 
an animal dying from West Nile. Mosquito-borne illnesses are a tough one to control, as is obvious by the fact that in third world countries there's still lots of problems with mosquito-borne illness. And uh, here in where we live in the United States, we don't have quite the same problem as you might see in certain uh, other countries. We fortunately have winter here and the mosquitoes are all dead now. It's very, very cold. We haven't seen any more mosquitoes. So we should be out of the woods. Hopefully if it stays cool, we shouldn't have to worry about this West Nile disease affecting our goats. However, there are some things you can do as a general management on your farm to keep the mosquito population down. So what can you do? Think about how do mosquitoes breed? Well, they breed in water. You see the little larva swimming in water. So any way you can improve the water situation on your your property where you don't want standing water, you don't want puddles, tractor ruts, uh, low spots in your field that wind up developing a, a big puddle or a pond. You want to try to avoid that, so just designing your property to avoid standing water. Your animal waterers, every three days you would want to clean those out so that they don't have standing uh, water where a mosquito can breed. You can also aerate the waters that will prevent mosquitoes. You can put fish in your waters. We've put goldfish in our cow's water troughs so that the goldfish will eat the mosquito larva and reduce the number of larvae you have there. And the cow troughs are deep enough where the goldfish can go to the bottom. They don't get slurped up by the cow. And that works really well. We've, we've seen that over this last year. The goldfish have survived the bait fish we've put in there. So there are some basic things you can do, just trying to reduce the mosquito population, uh, making sure you don't have feeders and bins exposed that water fills up in and sits. So as a general rule, just your usual practices for reducing mosquito population. However, if you have on your property streams, ponds, you're going to have some issues. And that's the case over the hill here at our family, the family farm over the hill. There is a pond there and ponds are going to be an issue with mosquitoes. There can be fish there, you can aerate the ponds, but if you have a pond, you're going to have some issues with mosquitoes. And sadly, you can only do so much to reduce the mosquito population. What really got us this year was the fact that it was such a wet year, there were so many mosquitoes, there was a boom in mosquitoes, and that caused the main problem. So, as far as Next year, if it's not as wet as it was this year, hopefully we won't have to worry about West Nile disease. But as of right now, I think we're fine. It's really cold and the mosquitoes should all be dead for the season. Joe Lind asks, will you be having any gardening or crop videos and do you have any? I already have talked about we will be doing some next year raised bed gardening a little bit. So you'll see a little bit of that. We do have a few videos in our log. And if you want to see, there is a playlist called Gardening Made Easy. If you click on our channel and you click on playlists, you can see Gardening Made Easy. Because me, if I'm going to garden, it has to be easy. I don't enjoy it like I do livestock. So if I'm gardening, it's gotta be something simple and easy. And that's what we share on those videos. We do have a few videos as far as an orchard goes. We had Dave from Northeast Edible. If you are looking for good fruit trees, check out Dave from Northeast Edible. If you're a homesteady pioneer, you can do that by clicking on the link below. It's five bucks a month. You can get a 10% discount on all your fruit trees from Northeast Edible. So become a pioneer, it's five bucks a month. It's 50 bucks for the year. And then buy yourself an orchard's worth of trees. You'll save 10%, it'll pay for itself. And you'll be doing business with a guy like Dave from Northeast Edible, who's a really good guy. And he has a YouTube channel. So search Northeast Edible and you can find Dave on YouTube and check out Northeast Edible. I think it's northeastedibleorchard.com. Anyway, Northeast Edible. We have some good videos we did with Dave starting our orchard last year, Joe Lynn. So you can find those under Gardening Made Easy, and I think we have a playlist about fruit, so check that one out too. Isabel has a good question that we get asked in person actually a lot when we're talking about homeschooling our children. She says, maybe you've answered this before, but what do the kids do in their free time when not in homeschool or doing chores? Are they in clubs or anything like that? Do they have friends over? I'm curious about their social lives and how living on a farm and being homeschooled affects them. So, good question, Isabel. 
First, I want to remind everyone watching our channel, we focus our channel on our homesteading life, but our homesteading life is a slice of the complete pie. So we do have a lot about our life that you don't see on this channel that we don't cover because it doesn't really hit home with homesteading. So that's always good to remember when you watch our videos. Just remember you're watching a slice, a little bit of a, a piece, and there's a lot elsewhere that's going on that we just keep to ourselves because we do value having uh, some something, keeping some things just private in our life. <laughs> so there's that. So you haven't seen, for example, our kids' social life because we don't include that on the channel. And we have no plans really to include their social life or even some of our own social life. Uh, the hobbies that we do that don't relate to homesteading, we don't share any of that because again, this channel focuses around home homesteady. It's about being self-sufficient. It's not a family vlog. Uh, but I don't mind the question, Isabel, because it's a good one for anyone who's interested in homeschooling or if they have family members who are interested in homeschooling. It's good to talk about socializing kids because this is one of those issues that is often brought up as a reason not to homeschool kids. People say, oh, you know, I like the idea, but they don't get the socialization that they need. And, you know, then those kids become weird homeschool kids, you know, weird homeschool kids. I would love to put this one to bed. <laughs> For one, if you are, I am a millennial. I'm a bit on the older side of the millennial spectrum. Uh, but if you're a millennial, or a very young kind of Gen Xer, or whatever was in between that. <laughs> I want you to think about some of the kids you went to school with. And if you're not, if you're older, I want you to think about kids either who you knew when they were my age or younger, like the youngest millennials, or whatever the, we're gonna call after millennials, that next generation coming up, think of some of those kids who are maybe teenagers right now, I want you to think about the average teenager you interact with who's gone to public school. And I want you to be honest and say, are they well socialized? So what do we mean by socialized, a kid being well socialized? The idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about a kid getting properly socialized, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, but I like to think about socialization the same way I think about socializing my dogs. <laughs> Children and dogs are very different. You don't train them the same way, but it is a good illustration to compare. When I think of a well-socialized dog, that's a dog that I can take on leash and walk through with a farmer's market in town and not worry. I could really, a well-socialized dog, not even have it on leash. Usually there's a leash law, so you gotta keep it on leash. But you could just enjoy yourself while your dog walks through the farmer's market, if he sees other dogs, he walks over and he politely sniffs them, makes friends with them. If he smells food, he doesn't jump up and bite it and eat it. He doesn't jump up on people. He's not obnoxious, he doesn't have bad habits. He's a nice dog to take to the market and when people see that dog and interact with it, they have a nice interaction. They pet the dog, oh, what a cute dog, such a good dog. You don't see a lot of dogs like that. I'm gonna be honest, even my own dogs, who I'm very proud of, are not socialized to the point where if I bring bones to the farmer's market, I just walk around relax the whole time. I focus a lot of bones training on socializing him for my farm. He's great with the livestock, he's great with people, but if he sees another dog at the farmer's market, he can be a little naughty. <laughs> he won't jump up and eat your food, he doesn't jump up on people, he's pretty good. I've taken him to farmer's markets before, but there are a couple of areas where I could have done better in socializing him. So that's socialization, a good dog, right? You have this pleasant experience. Now let's get a little more advanced here. What is a socialized young person, a teenager? Well, much in the same way, uh, a, a very social teenager is someone who I think can go into a room full of people and have a conversation with an adult, make eye contact, Talk about a shared interest, ask questions to that adult about something they're interested in. Uh, be involved, interact, have no problem talking to an older person or dealing with a younger person. That teenager who's dealing with a, a five-year-old or a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, a teenager can you know, interact with them. And, and I talk about a teenager really, I'm focusing on a teenager because 
a five-year-old kid is not going to have that same interaction with an adult or a baby younger than it that I think a well-socialized teenager could. I have experienced in my life, uh, recently I have met homeschooled teenagers who are just the most uh, respectful, uh, polite, well-rounded kids, because I still consider a teenager a kid. Uh, they can have a great conversation with me as an adult. We can talk about a shared interest, talk about things they're interested in, talk about things I'm interested in. They give me eye contact. We can have a nice conversation. I can enjoy time around these teenagers. They've been homeschooled. So how did they learn that socialization? Well, homeschooled kids can be socialized very easily by having them interact with others in social settings, whether it's clubs or other just engagements. If you bring them out into town with you and just interact with people on a social level like you do, uh, if you have a religion and you're involved with your religion, they can get exposed to different uh, ages of people w with a religious group or a, just another social group. Uh, any kind of activity where you're bringing them into groups with different ages. And here's, I think, one of the big keys to a well-socialized teenager and, and child and just right up into adulthood because it crosses over into adulthood especially. A well-socialized kid and human can interact with people that are not their peers. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions about homeschool versus public school is that public school does a better job at socializing kids, because I disagree. I think public school, when you take 20 kids all the same age and you put them in one room with one adult who is the master adult and gets to have all the rules laid down and be in charge, and those kids are kind of Lord of the Flies, creating their own ecosystem with the top kid and the bottom kid, but they're all the same age, so it's based off of like popularity and, well, we all like this and you don't, so you're weird and you're out. It creates this horrible thing. That's the reason so many of us have bad memories of middle school and high school, because it's an unnatural social system. It's an unnatural social scene. When else in your adult life are you ever put into a room with 20 people exactly your age and you're all on this level plane and then you have to kind of fight to get that hierarchy? That never happens. At work, you have people older than you and younger than you and people who've been there longer than you and people who've been there less than you. You have seniors, people who are in charge of you and people who are in your, you are in charge of or who you delegate things to. There's this rich system with all different structure. It's not this one you know, group of people all in the same spot in life. At work, when you're out in, in business, what, you know, when you're going and doing business, uh, socially, when you go to a party, you don't go to a party as an adult and it's only people who are 31 years old or th maybe 32 or 30 and you're all in the same room talking about the same subject. That's not how adult life works. So if we want to properly socialize kids for adult life where they have to interact with people who are above them and below them and all in the middle, we should be allowing them that experience at a young age. And this is why I use the example of socializing a dog. Because if you want to properly socialize a dog, when it's a puppy, you don't stick it in a room with just puppies and leave it in that room with just puppies for two years. If you do that, that dog will have no idea how to respect an older dog and not get its face bit off when it's playing around with an older dog like it's a puppy. It will not know how to deal with a younger dog because all it knows is dogs its age. It will play too rough with that younger dog. You need to expose a puppy to all kinds of different situations with older dogs, younger dogs, different animals, different people, different scenes. And that is not what public school does. For 13 years of a child's life, and if you add in college, who knows, that child is put in the same exact room, sit at your desk, get your stack of work, you're all the same age, you're all the same subject, the teacher is the master and you cannot disagree with the teacher. And it's that for 13 years of your life. 
And then that's gone. Year 14, if you don't go to college, or I didn't go to college, but the college situation is a little different than public school, and but we won't get into that right now. The point is, we are public school is socializing children in a way that is not preparing them for adult life. And if you think about teenagers that you've interacted with recently who go to public school, there are some good ones. I'm not, I'm not throwing out a blanket there. But there are lots of teenagers I have interacted with at public school who when, when you talk to, they don't look at you in the eye. They don't ask you questions. They don't answer your questions. It's, it's like pulling teeth. If you have any family members who are, you know, at that age bracket, and, and it's different than being shy. There is such a thing as someone who is an introvert and, you know, you need to develop a relation with before they'll open up to you. So I'm not, I'm not saying that shyness is the problem. Uh, but, but it's the ability to interact with someone older than you and younger and anywhere in between. And if you get your kids, like we have, involved socially off the farm, off the homestead, interacting with people who are older and younger. You can do this through social things, uh, if, there's, if you have a religion, uh, if you take any kind of extracurricular learning activities. There are a lot of homeschool groups will put together, there's a lot of homeschoolers who will put together homeschool groups who go and do events. The only area that can get you into trouble is you kind of are recreating that peer thing where it's all their peers. So it's good to have older kids and younger kids all kind of in the mix, I believe. Also, as far as socialization goes, one of the great things you can do with your kids is teach them about putting a little business together. I talked about this recently on the channel, giving your kids a egg business. If you were selling farm fresh eggs, you don't need that money. You're not making any money off your farm fresh eggs. Trust me, I've done the math with Accountant Mike many times. You are not making any money off your farm fresh eggs. So give that to your kid. Let them run with it and what that's going to do is they're going to have to interact with adults on a business level which means they're going to have to look the adult in the eye smile tell the story of their farm exchange money in a polite way uh, tell the story of how they came up with their pricing they're going to have to market themselves a little bit uh, my kids are little businessmen they my son when i used to do snowplow driving he would go with me and he would shovel and knock on the door with me and ask the people if they'd like their sidewalk shoveled and they'd pay him a little something. And these are older people and people my age. He wasn't interacting with anyone younger in the business world, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. But he was learning to interact, like, like all my kids are, learning to interact with people of all different ages and all different backgrounds, uh, older, younger, everywhere in between. I don't think public school is doing a good job at this. I'm not saying you're a bad parent if you send your kids to public school, but if you are sending your kids to public school, you need to make sure your kids are being properly socialized for real life. So after school, take them to do stuff. Take them to do, you know, put them in situations where they have to deal with older ones and younger ones than them. One of the greatest things about homeschool is when you start having your older kids teaching younger ones. And that whether it's your own children or if you have a homestead and younger kids come on the farm, let your kids give the tour. Whenever someone visits our farm, our kids give the tour, whether it's an adult or a child. And they deal with adults, but they also teach kids. And when an older kid teaches a younger kid, they develop this kindness towards younger ones that you don't get in public school very much. I remember being in second grade and those third graders, they were never kind to me. They were always mean. And I was always afraid of the third graders. And then when I went to middle school, I was afraid of the eighth graders. And then when it was high school, I was afraid of the seniors. Because generally speaking, public school creates a hierarchy where the older kids are mean to the little ones. Not always. Again, you might have a kid in public school who's very kind to younger kids, and that's great. I'm just saying on a general level, this is not just my opinion. Look at popular media, which is a mirror reflection of our society, and the older kids in the school are always picking on the younger kids. That's We all know that's how things happen in public school. Me and Kay both went to public school. We remember what it was like. It wasn't that long ago. And... I think you can really develop, you can socialize your kids at a homeschool level. I feel better than public school because you have more time to have them interact with 
people of all different ages, backgrounds, places, types. Traveling helps that. Uh, when you travel, interacting with locals, learning things in the local places, uh, just getting your hand, you know, field trips, diving into other cultures, all those things are good for socialization. And I just think public school is not doing a good job of that. That I truly believe, public school is not doing a good job of that. And if your kids are going to public school, you need to take over and make sure that they're getting it elsewhere. I feel that I got it elsewhere growing up. I was very involved in some extracurricular social things. I also was very involved with my dad and mom's home business. And so I learned a lot of socialization out of school that I then would bring into school too. So it's not impossible if your kids are public schooled. You can definitely make sure they get properly socialized. But I don't think public school is better at it than homeschool. I have interacted with homeschoolers now that are older than my kids who are teenagers who I just think are doing, they're just an example of how I would like my kids to turn out in five years. And I see that a lot from homeschool kids. Not all of them. Again, there is no one rule, one size fits all but I've seen it a lot from homeschool kids. I went really long on that one, but I'm passionate about it. We don't homeschool our kids uh, because for any, I mean, we don't homeschool them for any, because we don't want to deal with, I don't even know. Like, we just love homeschooling. We think it is the best thing you can do with your kids. If we didn't, we wouldn't do it. If we thought public school was better for kids, we would do it. We passionately believe that homeschool is better and that's okay if you disagree but it's a topic we will do more videos about homeschooling in the future because it is something that we're very passionate about and we think the society needs to change its mind on I've almost gone 20 minutes I think this is a record but uh, <laughs> we're gonna go to the next question Chelsea has pink hair cool pink hair Chelsea I like your thought process she talks about, uh, this is a question for one of our hunting videos. This last week you saw a buck come through the property. I was up in the tree with my bow and arrow, but I didn't shoot it. And she liked the reasons why I didn't shoot the buck. Uh, but then she asked me about my hunting setup. She started to think about hunting herself. And she saw that I use one of those climber stands. So if you watch that video, you can see it's a stand that you climb up the tree with. She says, I wonder if a tree climber makes more noise than maybe something else. Uh, also, it seems like you have a lot of gear. Is it possible to be successful hunting without the enormous investment? And that wasn't the only question about the money spent on my gear. Also, Candice, who asks a lot of questions on our Ask Home Study, uh, she says, You've been doing your videos about hunting and all your gear. It's a lot of gear, dude. I know getting free deer meat in the freezer is super and it's something you enjoy, but looking at all that expensive stuff it takes, would you say it's cost effective? What would accountant Mike say? He'd probably say shoot a bear. So two really good questions about kind of gear and hunting. So really quickly, let me answer first off the climbing stand, Chelsea. Yes, it does make some noise. You do have to kind of go in quietly as you can, but there are other tree stand options that are much quieter. They all have pros and cons. And there is a time and a place for the climber. It is the most comfortable stand I'm in. If I'm gonna do a long morning, I like going in that climber. I can take a nap in that thing safely and it's just wonderful. But it is noisy to set up and noisy to get down. So you have to kind of work around that. Now let's talk about the bigger question. Because as you have seen, if you've watched our hunting videos, I am a gear nut when it comes to hunting. I love getting hunting gear, trying new types of hunting. I have spent tons of money on hunting before I was sponsored by Moultrie and Summit Tree Stands. I spent a lot of money on hunting gear. I still do spend a lot of money on hunting gear for the things I'm not sponsored for. But you don't have to, by any means, spend more money than you get back in meat for hunting. Here's how you do it. If you are hunting to save money on good quality meat, you get your gun hunting license, you buy a $650 rifle kit. It's a rifle with a scope, ready to go, ready to go out there and shoot the deer. Off the rack rifles these days are great out to, I mean, a couple hundred yards. The scopes come with them, are nice glass. You can, for $650, get your rifle, your scope, 
another 20, 30, 40 bucks. You got your ammunition that will last you sighting that rifle in and into years of deer. And with an investment of about $700, your first year, if your state allows you two deer, generally on average, it's at least two deer with a rifle season. Uh, tags are not a whole lot of money for a resident if you're hunting deer as a resident. So for somewhere around 700 bucks, you don't need a tree stand, you don't need ground blinds, you don't need camouflage. All the gear you see me use, you don't need any of it. You need a weapon with a projectile and there's no more cost effective way than a rifle Bullets are not that expensive, and they're very effective at killing deer. And with a rifle in your hand, you can walk through the woods wearing whatever you want, see a deer at 100 yards. If you're quiet and slow, you could be wearing a prison jumpsuit, bright blaze orange, the whole thing, and the deer's not gonna see you because you're just walking quietly and you get the job done. And that deer will produce, a smaller doe produces 40 pounds of organic, I mean, amazing quality meat. If you value that at local farmer's market meat value, which is what a deer is, that 40, if it's 10 bucks per pound on average at the farmer's market, that's $400 worth of meat off of an average size dough. If you get two, that's $800. In your first year with rifle hunting, two does, you've already been profitable. And that's totally doable. You can absolutely do that. You might not do it your first year because my first year I made a lot of mistakes, but I made a lot of mistakes. I was bow and arrow hunting my first year. If I had been gun hunting my first year, given, I don't know if I would have missed or not, but I had multiple chances I could have killed deer with a gun in my hand. I just didn't have the gun license yet. I only had a bow license. If you're hunting to save money, buy a gun, do your gun license, and in one year's time you will be profitable, and in the next year and every year to come after that it is cheap, amazing quality meat in your freezer. You just can't beat it, and it's a great way to feed your family, save a little bit of money. Okay, now that said, let's go back to me. <laughs> what would Accountant Mike say about my habits? Yeah, he would probably give me a thumbs down. I spend a ton of time in a tree. I have spent a ton of money on gear, and the reason why is because I don't hunt just to save money on meat. I, I don't hunt to save money on meat. I started hunting to save money on meat, but since then, I have grown and progressed in life. I'm able to afford the meat that I like for my family by raising it myself. I hunt now because, I talked about this in the last hunting video I think I did, uh, I enjoy hunting. I love going out into the woods. I love being outside. I love the quality of meat you can get from the woods. It's all part of that experience. And in the end of a good season, I still am profitable. So last season, I didn't spend much money last season on gear. All the gear is the gear I'd already had. Last season, I was in Connecticut on properties I've been hunting for years. I already had stands there. I already had cameras running. I did not put a lot of money into last season and I harvested four deer last season. Last season was a very profitable year. Now this year I've got some new gear. A lot of that's been sponsored but if I had paid for it there would have been a lot of money there and I have not yet got a deer. So so far this year has been pretty thumbs down from Accountant Mike's standpoint. But again I don't hunt to save money. I hunt for the meat. I hunt to go out in the woods. I hunt uh, because I'm an outdoorsman and I just like being out there. I love watching deer and sitting up in the trees and just the whole experience is, is why I hunt. And so now uh, it's different reasons. Plus you cannot buy venison in the store. You can buy farm raised venison, but why would you do that? It's expensive and it's not as good as the venison in your backyard. And my kids and me love venison. Okay too, we all love venison. So I, I just can't buy that product. So I gotta hunt it. And because I like hunting, I spend a lot of money, money on gear. And the way I look at it at the end of the day, if you are hunting and you enjoy it, if it's a, a hobby for you, even if you're not profitable in the sense that you spend less money than you earn in meat back, it is still a more profitable hobby than golfing. So there or any other of the hobbies that you don't get like a bunch of meat from. <laughs> we talked about having lost the goat we were going to breed, Lacey and probably Gizmo too. Uh, the buck, he passed away from West Nile as we've already said. 
Uh, a lot of people asked us about the next buck. So let me explain. If you haven't seen that video, the go we were go the buck we were going to breed Lacey and Gizmo to died, and we talked about now we've lost those good genetics, and we have delayed our timeline because the next buck we're going to breed to is a couple months away from being here and being ready to breed the girls, and so it just slows down our timeline. And we had a lot of questions about that decision and why we are going to, what we're gonna do and why. Linda asks, isn't it better for you personally to rent a local buck so you have milk? You can always raise the kids for me, not worry about genetics this season. So that's a great question, Linda. And Jennifer then follows that up with, with the new buck coming from the same breeder. So we mentioned that we're getting a new buck, same breeder as where Gizmo came from, is there a possibility that she could be related to the next buck? Okay, so Linda and Jennifer. Let's kind of cover this goat breeding. And they were not the only questions about this, just the only ones that did hashtag ask home study. A lot of people were wondering about the decision with the buck. So let me explain. We do not want to breed our goats to just the nearest Nubian buck. We look at breeding our herd, our livestock differently. Again, let's go back to the decisions we make, animal husbandry, our goals. What are our goals on this homestead? Our goals on this homestead are to feed our family the best quality we can. And if we have surplus, make a little bit of money from the surplus by selling that and sharing it with the local community around us. But it's, that's a surplus thing. That's not our goal to have a business. We, as an animal husbandry goal, want to have the best quality livestock. Because if you want the best quality food, you need to have the best quality livestock. That's where the best quality food comes from. And the better the quality livestock, the easier your job is. We have seen that. We have, we just realized the other day we were doing the math, 10 years of experience now homesteading. Between the time that Kendra spent uh, as a teenager here on her family homestead, an older teenager caring for livestock, and then the time we've had our own as a married couple, the time I've spent as an outdoorsman, it's over 10 years of like homesteading skills. And in that 10 years time of experience with livestock, working with livestock, working from the land, we have seen time and time again, better quality livestock makes your life easier. You have less problems with better quality livestock. So we want to have the best quality livestock we can. Homesteading is a long game. You breed a cow, it's a nine month gestation. And before that calf then becomes a milker for you, we're talking another you know, 15 months till breeding, and then at that 15 month, another nine. So from getting Ladybug to milking Luna is over two years time. That's a long time to get there. I didn't do the math quickly in my head, but if I take the time to do the math, nine months from breeding Ladybug to having Luna, and then 15 to breed is another 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's six months, 9, 10, 11, 12, so that's two years. Yeah, it's like three years before. Somebody in the comments below, I don't want to edit this out. Anyway, it's a long time from breeding your calf to milking that calf as a cow. Comment below when you do the math for me. The point is, in that tons of time it takes, and goats are shorter, they're a five month gestation, but it's the same idea five months and then you have to take that goat doling and raise her to the age where she can be bred and then five more months on top of that it's always a long game so to play a long game you have to plan for your goals and make them a priority we want to have good quality homesteading livestock so i'm not going to use up one breeding on well let's just use the local neighborhood nubian because then we'll have milk a month sooner I would much rather delay the breeding one month to make sure we get a good quality genetics into our herd than rush out and find the nearest Nubian that buck that's around town and just have him breed. Now there is a chance the nearest Nubian buck around town has some good genetics. If that's the case, sure, go for it. But we would much rather take the time to breed correctly for our goals 
than just find something local and get on the milk train. Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, if we go a month or two without milk from Ladybug, we can buy local milk. If we go through a gallon a week, it's eight bucks or 10 bucks a gallon. You know, we're talking 80 bucks at the end of two months of buying milk. It'd be a bummer, but 80 bucks isn't gonna break us. If I breed good quality livestock, I can sell that good quality livestock and make up that $80 difference. Easy. Good quality livestock can fetch a premium price, but that time, that time is lost. And time, money, you can always make more money. You can never make more time. And it is a long game. So I would much rather breed good quality genetics, even if it takes longer, than just rush out and find a local buck to breed to if he's not the genetics I'm looking for. We always value a good quality breeding over speed and time and getting things done. And a homesteader, as a homesteader, good advice for you. Don't, it's, it's a long game. All this stuff takes a long time. So focus on value, quality first, not quantity. Really develop a good quality small herd or if it's crops, same thing, good quality seed, good quality gardens. Go for quality. Quality will, in the long run, treat you better than quantity because quantity is more work and quantity is, if it's bad quality, is even more work of the more work. As far as will the buck that we get from the same breeder be related to gizmo? That is a possibility, but that's okay. We won't, gizmo is not going to be bred this year. Gizmo is too small. So it won't be till next year. And at that point, the buck that Kazan has bred everybody to will no longer be the right buck to have around because he's bred everyone and all their offspring now are related to him. And the way is often done with bucks, he'll be sold and a new buck will be brought on. So that's kind of the way we're gonna handle that for now. Somebody mentioned two is one, one is none. Why not have two bucks instead of just one? Kind of an easier said than done thing on a homestead scale. Every buck you need to keep separate from your does. So the minute you have two bucks, now you have two separate buck pens, two separate feedings, uh, two separate animals to worry about getting out. I find generally on a homestead level, it makes more sense to find someone who does buck services or work with someone who has the genetics you want than keeping two bucks of your own. A herd size that Kazan has, it's good to have a buck there. Maybe for something her size she would want to have two, uh, but obviously she doesn't because she doesn't. <laughs> uh, for something our size, it doesn't even hardly make sense to keep a buck on the property until we have a much bigger herd and are actually selling livestock as a business. And I don't know that we'll ever get to that size, so it may never make sense. Hope that answers all the buck breeding questions and our reasoning as to why we're waiting on this good quality buck to come even if it's a month or two late. I had to throw this in here because while I was recording over in the uh, studio, Kay had been talking to the breeder of the goats that the new buck is coming from and we had the question, is Gizmo going to be related to this buck and if so, we can't breed Gizmo to the buck. Turns out, the buck that is coming here is not related to Gizmo and the breeder who we got Gizmo from is was going to breed this buck to Gizmo because Gizmo was one of her favorites and we just happened to want one of her favorites and she was a good business person and let us buy the goat we wanted. <laughs> so we're going to be doing something that she wanted to do all along which is breed Gizmo to the buck coming who, can I give away his name? His name is Quinn. So more on Quinn probably in a month or two. Crystal wants to know, is it possible to grow your own hay on a homestead? Absolutely, Crystal. If you have a big enough field, there you go. You're growing your own hay. The real question is, is it possible to then harvest your own hay for your family on your homestead? And while the answer again there is, yeah, surely, if you have the money or the equipment already. The equipment for doing hay is very expensive. You can spend $100,000 on a tractor and hay making equipment. And as a homesteader, I rarely think you're gonna make that back in the hay that you use unless you start selling hay. And hay is a lifestyle. If you've ever dealt with a hay farmer, 
and tried to even plan a hay delivery, you know that farmer, when you talk to them, they're like, all right, well, I'm probably going to cut my hay next week if the weather cooperates. I've been waiting because it's been raining. If I get an afternoon where I can cut it and then bale it, then maybe I can get a delivery to you if the hay, if the rain holds off. But the chances of the rain holding off next week, I don't know. It's been a really wet year. It just kind of takes over your life. If you want a homestead, you probably want a homestead because you want to grow a garden. You like playing in the dirt. You like dealing with goats or cows or you want to have some chickens and get your farm fresh eggs, you probably don't want to spend your life looking at the weather to see if you can cut your grass and then bale it and then trying to store that somewhere and letting it cure and all that other stuff. I believe truly haying is for farmers because they're used to that lifestyle whereas homesteaders, especially in this day and age, many of us are doing it as a hobby, are much better off just finding a good hay source or doing what we're thinking about doing if you have the property but not the equipment, letting a farmer essentially lease your land and paying for that lease to you in hay that you can use for your livestock. That I think is a great option because you get to use some of your own properties. Hey, the farmer gets paid back in product and he doesn't have to pay for the land and everybody wins. Farmer's used to that lifestyle. He wants more hay. He wants to sell more hay and you can have your free time and your hay. So I hope that answers that, Crystal. I never encourage a homesteader to do their own hay or their own feed for the most part on that matter for that very same reason. Marge, do you have to have a license to have a homestead? Excuse me, officer. Let me show you my license to homestead. Marge, kind of a Funny question. So I'm going to talk first about to have a homestead. A homestead is just a place where you have some production going on to take care of your family, right? You own a home and you turn it into a homestead by making it productive. So you grow a garden, you have a couple chickens, you have an herb garden, or you have a bigger property like we do and you have some goats and some cows. Uh, so to have a homestead, I mean, you could live in an apartment and have a balcony where you go out and you do herbs and maybe you have a couple potted plants and, you know, like a, a beehive or a small scale aquaponics or something. And that could be your homestead. That's great. If you call that your homestead, great. So no, you don't need a license to have a homestead. But that doesn't mean there's no regulation stopping you from homesteading and that also doesn't mean you don't need to be licensed to do some business things off your homestead. So uh, the reply to Marge, Redbird said if you're running it as a business by selling eggs and such you might have to have a license uh, or the proper zoning. So this is one of those questions I can't possibly answer because I don't know where you live or your local laws but I can give you some good suggestions. If you want to have a homestead Essentially what you're saying is you want to have a garden. Usually that's okay unless you live in an HOA where they have a thing against gardens. And in that case, oof, I'm sorry. But usually you can have a garden, so just have a garden. Sometimes they say you can't have it in your front yard. You got to have it in your backyard. So again, like Redbird said, check zoning, your town hall zoning. And if you have an HOA, you got to look at their rules. Best thing is to just get out of that HOA and never go back. Then, if you want to have livestock, your town hall might have some rules about what livestock you have. So again, go to the town hall, check zoning. This can be very different from town to town. Your town might have a right to agriculture or a right to farm, which means everybody can have some animals. Back at our old homestead in Connecticut, we lived in a town with the right to farm. So everybody could have some animals, which was awesome. Everybody couldn't have as many as they wanted. You had to have at least five acres to have unlimited animals, but everybody could have something. So that was great. And then when it comes to selling product, that may require some licensing, but not always. Uh, usually you to sell eggs on the side of your driveway, you don't need to have any kind of licensing. However, that's up to you whether or not you want to take on that kind of liability. If you're just selling to friends and family, Usually it's not a big deal, but this isn't legal advice. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying what I've seen. When we sold at Squash Hollow, we sold to people we didn't know. And so we became business, which meant we had 
registered with the state as a business. There was no agricultural licensing to do what we wanted to do. That only came into play if you were doing value added products. Like if you wanted to sell jams or pies, you would have to have a commercial kitchen. And if you didn't have one of those at your own homestead in Connecticut, you could actually rent a commercial kitchen, produce your product, and then with a proper refrigeration vehicle, get it back to your farm and sell it there from your farm. To sell from the farm, you needed a place to sell from. That would need to be approved by local zoning. So some things, especially when it comes to business, like Redbird said, you might need to have licensing or at least the proper zoning. However, not all things. And again, if you're just selling to friends and family, you know, that's what, that one's up to you. <laughs> it depends, especially when it comes to the friends part. Family, it's like whatever, but friends, is it really your friends who if they get sick off your product, they're gonna be like, whatever, dude, it's cool. Or is it like friend of a friend who they get sick off your product and then they're like, dude, you got me sick, I'm suing you. <laughs> so it gets a little hairy when you start doing business. But to have a homestead, no, you don't need a license to homestead, but there might be some rules against it. And I ranted and raved against that last week all the zoning laws and things that keep you back from homesteading. So I won't get all worked up about it. It's annoying that it exists, but it's the world we live in. And so you just have to approach it tactically and smart and try to outsmart the stupid rules that exist. He didn't have as many questions as usual this week. So I figured I'd go back into the folder of unanswered questions. The times in the month where we don't get to all the questions uh, there's a folder I keep on my computer where I put unanswered questions. So if you haven't had your question answered, that's because of three reasons. I either didn't have a chance to get to it yet and it's in a folder called unanswered and I may get to it still. It's a very cow related question and all those questions go into my folder called ask the cowgirl and probably in a week or two we'll be doing another ask the cowgirl where I have K with me because I'm not fit to answer most of the cow questions by myself. Or third, it was a question that was inappropriate or not going to help anyone but you out. And even you, it was more just like satisfying your curiosity. Essentially a question that I just am not gonna answer no matter what. <laughs> or for some of you, I actually respond to you in the comments below and say like, hey, I already answered this or whatever. But I try to at least respond to you. If I'm not going to answer your question on Ask Home Study, on purpose, I usually try to let you know in the comments below when I answer you and say, hey, I already covered this. I already talked about quails and rabbits like eight times. We're gonna get to it. <laughs> so yeah, that should explain that. But let me answer a couple of the old ones. Alan Colors, our token vegan, <laughs> he says he doesn't wanna become the token, uh, or vegetarian rather. Uh, he asked us a question a couple episodes ago about homesteader who is vegetarian or vegan. And we talked about, can you be a homesteader and be vegan or homesteader and be vegetarian? And just to sum that up, basically I said, I think it would be hard to homestead as a vegan. You can do it with just crops, but livestock works so well into things. But sure, you could grow just crops. Uh, but vegetarian would be much better off because you could have chickens and that sort of thing and dairy animals. Anyway, he asked another question when we talked about the situation with owning dairy cows. And if you had a cow like Ladybug, you have this dairy cow, let's say you couldn't get her bred and she stopped being productive at a young age, like four or five years old, she stopped calving and you just couldn't get her bred and she wasn't producing milk anymore and she was just kind of out there eating your grass and in the winter time being fed hay. Alan wants to know, we talked about in that situation, we said we would cull the cow. We would kill that cow and eat it because a four or five year old dairy cow has a lot of life ahead of it and to pay for to feed that animal and to take care of that animal on a homestead they need to be giving back it needs to be a give and take alan said would you consider a third option selling the cow rather than culling versus keeping it as a pet i think that the emotional pain of ch and challenge of culling or selling for harvesting would be less than eating your family cow for the next six months. So what Alan is saying is if you have this family cow like Ladybug and she stops producing and you feel bad about it, wouldn't it be better just to sell her to somebody else? And that way you don't have to deal with the emotional pain of killing her and then eating her. So on the surface level, you could take a cow like Ladybug down to 
the auction and get you know something for her and they're gonna take her and butcher her and eat her and you don't have to sit there every night cutting up ladybug steaks and eating them as you salt them with your tears oh, I miss her but she's so good past the A1 sauce <laughs> So it, it, I'm sure that's something people have done. I'm sure they say, well, you know what? She's not good for us anymore. We'll have her processed and we'll either sell the meat or sell her to someone who will have her processed. And if that's the route you choose to go, the animal is still going to be killed. You're not getting around that, but at least you're not eating tear steaks every night. So sure, Alan, if, if, if you want to go that route, you might not get what you want for a dairy cow at the auction. You're probably not gonna get much money. You might be better off processing it yourself and at least having the value in the meat than taking the little bit of money you're gonna get at the auction for a dairy cow that's gonna be used for meat. You might just have a hard time getting rid of that cow. And comment below, you would know better than me if you've done it. We've never had this experience taking a dairy cow to an auction for meat. So maybe you have some better experience than me. If you do, comment below for sure. Let us know your experience. The comments are such a good part of why YouTube is so helpful. But then, he t just the idea that you could sell the cow uh, as a pet. Um, well, I, I think Alan acknowledged that you would be selling it for harvesting. The, the thing is, when you sell livestock, you sell them because somebody wants them, because they have value. And the fact is, a non-productive dairy cow doesn't have a lot of value in the eyes of most potential buyers. People who are looking to buy a cow are looking to buy a, a dairy cow because they're looking for production. They're not looking for a pet. You can create value in that non, we talked about before on this uh, Ask Home Study, uh, some a friend of ours who turned a, a free marten, a cow that is essentially a non-productive cow, into a cow that could be ridden. So she made value for the cow. But someone is only gonna buy that cow for the value they have, and a dairy cow's value is in its calves and in its milk, not so much in its meat. So it will be harder to sell that cow. And like I said, you might not get the value you want from it, Alan. Is that a better option than you know crying every night as you eat the steaks? I, I think, I don't honestly know. I've never eaten an animal that's been a long time dairy animal of ours that we've cared for. I've eaten plenty of our own animals, but I knew from day one they were there for meat. And so I can't honestly tell you how it would feel. I think that I'd be able to handle it and the rest of us, but I don't know if it was ladybug and we were cutting up ladybug steaks every night, would it be easier just to bring her to auction? And then there's the flip side of that is you bring that cow to auction and now you don't know what's gonna happen to it. If you have this nice cow that you've cared for your whole life and you know, well, you know what? We're gonna process her. I trust my butcher. He does a good job. She's gonna have a peaceful end and then we can enjoy the meat as a family. That might be better than just bringing her down to auction and saying, all right, I don't know what's gonna to happen to her. I don't know if the people are gonna be kind to her. I don't know if she's gonna be scared at the end. It's a hard question, it often is, uh, covering these, these issues of putting your your animals down and whether or not you kill them and eat them. Um, but I, I wonder if it wouldn't be just kinder to your animal to put her down in familiar settings. And uh, well, a cow you wouldn't be putting down on your own farm because you'd have no way to get it to the butcher, which means you would have to take the cow to the butcher. It's a complicated one, Alan, it's complicated. So I hope my muddy answer answers a little bit of your question. Interesting, we'll fit one more question in here about putting down your animals. Karen asks, uh, they've never lost a chicken due to predators or they've never processed any. What is the kindest method to use to kill a hen if they have a broken leg or other injury? What method do you use for butchering meat chickens if they are different, why? Great question, Karen. So when we process meat chickens, we put them in a killing cone. This holds them steady and secure, holding a bird tightly by the wings, kind of calms them down a little bit. They're upside down so they become lightheaded and as you slit their throat and they lose blood, it's they fall asleep, essentially. Um, it is not a violent death for them. It's one of the better ways you can do it. Commercially, chickens are stunned instantly. They're electrocuted, they die, and then they're processed. One of the reasons why you'll find in a store-bought chicken uh, some black around the wings, those little veins filled with black, that's coagulated blood. The 
little black stuff left there. It's like little remnants of blood in there because they were stunned first. They weren't bled out. So we prefer to go the killing cone route with our birds. As far as a uh, chicken that's injured, I would I kill it the same way. We put it in a killing cone and we cut it, allowing it to fall asleep. Some people watch that kind of death and they think it must be painful. It takes longer to do. Often people will say, just take a hatchet and just boom, cut the head right off. That is an option. You can just cut the chicken's head clean off. But you've heard the saying, running around like a chicken with its head cut off, they will still convulse, they'll still move and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And if you're trying to protect the meat from being damaged, the killing cone does a good job of that. So if it's an injured animal that you still want to eat, broken leg, uh, you might want to do the killing cone route. If it's been injured by a wild animal, let's say like a coyote or a fox got at that chicken and you saved it but it's dying and you decide to kill it, I would not eat that meat because you risk, what if the coyote had rabies and it's saliva's all over the thing. Uh, if it like hurt its leg or something or had like a deformity, that's another story. Usually when we're culling animals, we usually don't wind up eating them unless we are culling them because they were injured by something that we saw and we know it's okay to eat the meat. If it's some kind of weird disease or the animal's not acting right, stuff like that will just pass because we don't want to get anything weird into us. One, one more question about dog training. Jennifer wanted to know, uh, with Bones and Poppy, I have two labs. I use a whistle to bring the bones back to me. Will I use a different whistle for Poppy? No. <laughs> uh, some people have done this. Oftentimes, uh, you will create your own return whistle. But in my mind, if I want my dogs to come to me, I don't want just one to come to me. I want them both to come to me. I train my dogs for hunting scenarios. So when I'm calling my dogs back, it's because I need them back for protection. They need to be close to me. They both just need to be there by my side. And I don't want to have to remember, oh, this is Bones and this is Poppy's return whistle. For me, both dogs come back to the same whistle. There is a difference in sending dogs. And this is something I've been asked from time to time on the channel with the dog training. When it comes to the dog's commands, I'm not training them specific commands for them. If I want the dogs to sit, I want them both to sit. If I want a dog in the crate, I want them both in the crate. But if I'm out in the field, I got two dogs with me and a bird flushes and it dies over here, I do train my dogs. Their sending command is their name, their call name. Bones, pop, and they only are allowed to run and get that bird, run and retrieve when they hear their name. So I don't use their name to call them to me. That's what the whistle's for. I use their name to send them. And that way my dogs, if something happens and a bird gets shot or whatever, they stay by my side until I choose which dog to send. I could send them both if I wanted to, uh, but depending on the side of the dog, I've never hunted with two, so this is planning ahead because eventually I will hunt with the two. Uh, yes, I want to send them with their call name. That's because I'm training uh, bird hunting dogs. You might train your dogs differently depending on your needs. Superfan T. Roo says, great video as always, but the music's too loud. Talking about one of uh, last, ask, last week's Ask Home Study video. And then he says, I have, there's a hissing when you're in the basement workshop. Huh, you're right T. Roo, there is a hissing. Hmm, let me go find that. Well, T. Roo, good news and bad news. There is a humidifier, dehumidifier running that I just turned off, that I try to remember to turn off every week and then turn back on when I'm all done recording this. But we are in a basement. There's a boiler running right over there. There's some plumbing noises. My computer has a fan that runs when I record. So unfortunately, I can't get rid of all the hissing noises. Probably should have put this question at the end you know what, that's what I'll do. I'll edit this one to the end. That way it doesn't ruin the video for the rest of you watching, saying, oh, there's that hissing noise again. <laughs> Sorry, Tiru, uh, we are working in a basement right now. There will be a recording studio in the future where we can record podcasts and quiet Q&As, 
but for now this is the best we can do. So I hope you can bear with me as we do the rest of our videos. And now I'll put this at the end of the video so it doesn't ruin the video for everybody else. Hopefully by next week you forget about the hissing. <laughs> oh, I'm recording here. Did I record the dog question? Uh, I don't know what just happened. I think I just recorded the dog question. Anyway, that's it for Ask Homesteady this week. If you want to get a question answered, just hashtag Ask Homesteady one word. We'll be sure to get it on our weekly show as much as we can fit in and we should be doing an Ask the Cow Girl soon. So if you have some good cow questions, get them in this week because probably by next week or the week later we'll have enough to do another Ask the Cow Girl. We'll get Kay with me and we'll answer your cow related questions. And if you love what we do on this channel and you want to make sure that we don't go away, we don't go do something else, you can support us in two ways. Click below to become a Homesteady Pioneer. There's a link below. Five bucks a month, it is the best way to support our channel. It allows us to have a reliable income every month from this channel, which means five days a week I can produce videos, which is what we do, five days a week. And you'll notice we're releasing them in the morning. We're experimenting with the morning schedule, and I think we might stick with it. We've had a lot of good feedback. You guys seem to like the morning videos, and they perform really well on YouTube. So I think we're gonna wind up changing our release schedule. And if you don't want to spend a penny extra, but you still want to support us, when you do shopping on Amazon, type in www.amsteady.com, amsteady.com. It will forward you instantly to Amazon. You don't spend a penny extra, but Amazon rewards us for sending you there with a small percentage of all your purchases. And so we make every month a nice amount of money through that Amsteady program because Viewers like you who want to help us but can't spend five bucks a month, which we totally understand uh, on the Pioneer program, take the time, just a second, to type in amsteady.com. It is a huge way you can help us without spending any extra money. And if you do a lot of shopping on Amazon, it can really add up on our end and help us to keep doing this full time. So we thank you so much to those of you who do Amsteady faithfully. I keep getting asked when am I gonna set it up for Canada and the other countries. They've made It's a little complicated to do, but I will get to it soon. Probably after hunting season, because a lot of my time lately has been spent out in the field trying to put some meat in the freezer, but I will do it soon. Because I know there's a lot of you out there who want to support us, but can't because you're in Canada or in Europe or whatever. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in next week's videos, which will be coming out Monday morning when you wake up.